Welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, August 21st, we are studying Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1-9. to In today's text, St. Paul continues to write to Christians in specific vocations. These verses speak to children and parents, and to bondservants and masters. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Andy Wright. Pastor Wright serves at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Topeka, Kansas. Pastor Wright, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Pastor Wright, give us some context as we get started. What should we know about this epistle and what Paul's been up to leading up to our text? Absolutely. So here we are, you know, kind of uh, uh, beginning chapter 6. We're getting into the the end of this epistle, so he's starting to tie some things up. You know, uh, right before this, uh, chapter 5 in, ends with that great kind of ecclesial text about the, the church and then that relationship we have with husband and wife and, you know, that interplay and order that God gives us. And, and this is not separate from that. Really, it ties in well um, to what St. Paul um, is addressing which gets to the bigger unity and order that we see within the church of God. You know, the Ephesians were dealing with some, you know, how do Gentiles and and things fit into the church, you know, with with people who come from a Jewish background and you're you're dealing with predominantly coming out of, you know, Gentile nature of of things uh, and leading that former life. So there's, uh, Ephesians is one of those great epistles that it just has this quite this contrast of, of here, how does this all fit together? And then there's this, not this, but this, there's this, here's here's where you are in this, here's how you live with one another, here's what you're instructed to do. So chapter six is really kind of hitting this home in the estate of the family in particular as it begins, and then he'll tie things together, you know, at the end of this chapter past our text today. So that's kind of the, the context that we're in. And, and these verses in particular too, for us as Lutherans are, um, you know, they're, they're really well known in terms of they're in the, the table of duties in the small catechism, which is, I, uh, I mean, we'll get to this as we talk about it, but I think that's one of the most overlooked sections of the small catechism. But I think it's a very important part, not only in its content, but even how it teaches us about our vocation for one, but even how to think and how it forms us, you know, um, as we go through this life together in the church and even in our families and whatnot. So that's where we're at picking up here in Ephesians chapter six. So piggybacking right off of the the, the, the discussion chapter five, which I mean, that's uh, the chapter divisions are, you know, are are just arbitrary in terms of, you know, we've, those have been later additions. So right. it's, it's the, the thought is continuing of what he, he's already put before us in chapter five. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, let's go to the, the thought of the table of duties uh, right away here, because this is, this section is often even just called Paul's table of duties in Ephesians. And, mm-hmm. and I know this is an interest of yours. You've written the book for CPH called Faithfully Formed the Lutheran Confessions in Daily Life. And like the table of duties from the small catechism mm-hmm. is for daily life, and yet, as you said, it does tend to be one of those sections that we overlook in the small catechism. We talk about the six chief parts, and sometimes we forget about the daily prayers that are there and this table of duties. I mean, so talk more about the importance of the table of duties, this kind of instruction for Christian living. Sure. Yeah. So when Luther, you know, puts this in the the table of the of duties, um, he starts off kind of in a sense talking about the table of duties, like certain passages of scriptures for various orders and positions, which these people are to be admonished as a special lesson in their office and service. So that's what the reader's edition, you know, has over there. And that's, you know, taking from Luther's German text um, of what he uses. So it's really Pauline, first off, of what what, um, Luther does here, uh, that St. Paul as he's writing to the Ephesians, we see this Colossians as well has a, you know, a table of duties to it, even in Galatians. But here really in Ephesians 6, we see this come, come together that to be a Christian is to have a new life. And, and there's substantial content to that. 
I think the table of duties is often abstracted because we we like to talk in generalities of the vocation of a father or a husband. And we think, okay, I'm a Christian father. I'm a Christian husband. I'm a Christian son. Very true statements, right? Yeah. But what does that look like? What does that mean? You know, ask that good Lutheran question. So what Paul does in the epistles, especially, is he says, this is what it looks like to be a Christian child, right? As we'll look at in Ephesians 6, this is what it looks like to be a Christian father. And what not only are you what it looks like, but this is what God commands and teaches you, you are to have toward one another as you relate even in those specific vocations. But there's there's content to it. It's not just figure out what this means. I mean, there's certain things that we use our, our reason and, you know, orderliness that we have. But God does teach us, you know, the, the foundation of, of what these things actually look like in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that gets to the bigger issue, too, of, of how, you know, when we talk about like something, the third use of the law, that God, God his instruction is actually good for us. And we want to hear and learn and model our lives after that. So the table of duties for Luther then is a way of kind of taking this understanding, you know, in the medieval world, um, the holy orders were simply a clerical thing. You know, you had a higher state in life when you were a priest or a bishop or even, you know, joined a monastery or those kind of things. But God orders daily life for Christian fathers and mothers and, and children. Even children have an important place in the kingdom of God. And that's, I mean, in Paul's day, I mean, that's monumental. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that, that's such a, such a big thing with that. So Luther really is very Pauline in the table of duties. And I think it's helpful for us to, that he uses this, not only specific proof passages, for lack of a better term, but, but this mindset of understanding, let's listen to God and how he speaks to us where God has called us to be. Mm. In the context of the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul has mentioned several times and really emphasized this unity in the church between Jew and Gentile. All people who are in Christ are called into this one body by the one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism, all those ones there in chapter 4. Here in, in this table of duties, we're, I think maybe we're prone to think about it more individually, and, and to be sure, there is an individual aspect to all of these things, a husband and a wife, a child and a parent, a servant and a master. And yet, he puts it within that larger context of the Church. I mean, one of the things you, you said, I think, is helpful, that it means that even the, the littlest child has an important place in the, in the family of God, even the, the lowest servant has an important place in God's people. And maybe that that's just something we don't always think about when it comes to Christian living. We often, and maybe this is our American tendency, we think about it individualistically. Uh, Paul doesn't ignore that, but he puts it in the context of the body. And I think that's an important thing to, to bring out just from the letter to the Ephesians and the context here. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, I, I stress often with you know, God's people that I serve is, you know, when we look at the third article of the creed, we're, we're rightfully so, we always stress, you know, that um, God is the one who calls us, right? I believe I cannot by my own reason or spring, strength, you know, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. But when God calls us by the gospel, what else does he do? He gathers us. Hmm. He gathers us together as the church. So you're individually a member of it, but this unity in the church is not opposed to it, and, and, they're, and they go together. So which is more important, the individual Christian or the body? Yes, yes, right? <laughs> and, and even then, too, um, last night I was looking at uh, Dr. Winger's commentary on Ephesians, which is outstanding. It's one of my favorite in the Concordia commentary series. I just keep coming back to it again and again, even for things outside of Ephesians. But he brought up this point that it was kind of a, well, duh, he stated the obvious, but it, it was really profound. And he was talking about how when Paul, you know, addresses the children, when he addresses them, it's in the vocative case in our text, mm -hmm. you know, children, obey or heed or, you know, your parents, whatever, there's kids listening to this. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the epistles were read in the public assembly. They were read at church. So think about on Sunday morning, when you're preaching or reading the Word of God, you have 90-year-olds, you have 80-year-olds, you have 2-year-olds, you have infants. They're all the body of Christ together. You know, a, a, another 
pet peeve of mine, I guess, is just my soapbox time today. But, uh, you know, uh, the thing says is uh, when people say, you know, well, the, the kids are the church or the future of the church. They're the ones we should be concerned about. Well, of course they are. But so is the older people, too. You know, we're all the body of Christ. Let's yeah. not put divisions where God has not put divisions. Now, there are distinctions and there's orderness to it. And that's that goes along with that. But to be the body of Christ is to have that unity, right? So that, you know, questioning it, which is more important, the young people or the old people in the church? Yes. <laughs> you know, and and so this is, so, I mean, Paul is, I mean, this is scripture. This is teaching us this principle. This is teaching us about who we are as individual members, but it's teaching us who we are together as the body of Christ. And that, that's what makes it so beautiful. Uh, the, yeah. the letter to the Ephesians is just, it's, it's wonderful. I love yeah. it. Well, and even what you, you know, children are the future of the church is, isn't quite right. Children are the church. That, right. That's the yes. way Paul speaks to them here. He doesn't say, when you grow up and become a, a voting member of the congregation, he says, here is what God has given you right now as children, because you are a part of this church just as much as your parents are a part of this church. So yeah, fantastic yeah. stuff. And, yeah. and as such, there's responsibilities and duties that God calls you to. Yes, Do that. that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's go ahead yeah. and read then what those responsibilities and duties are here from Ephesians chapter six. We're beginning at verse one. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. That is our text for today, Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 9. Pastor Wright, we've been talking about children already. Let's talk about what Paul says their duty is within the church, what their Christian life looks like. He says, obey your parents in the Lord, this is right. Yeah, so right from the get-go then, you know, so he singles them out, you know, children. So it's, it, you can almost kind of, you know, put yourself as you're listening to this, It's it's kind of like, uh, you know, as a preacher, you don't necessarily single people out, but you can sometimes hear it when you say like, and, and fathers or, you know, or whatever. And you kind of see the ears, you know, the head pop up a little bit or perk up. Like I'm talking to you guys, right? I'm talking to you now. Right. Um, so, you know, children, you know, this, I'm, I'm talking to you, listen, obey your parents, heed your parents, right? Sounds simple, right? Listen to your parents but very profound of, of what's being said. So he gets to the, the point of that this is such a, the, the, the estate of parents in, in, in the home is so vital to the, the very fabric of who we are as God's people, both in the church and even outside of the church. There's, there, and there's a, an overlap between it. Hmm. So you know, that to obey your parents, um, in the Lord for this is, he says, righteous. Hmm. So when you obey your parents, um, Dr. We, um, Winger, uh, translates it as heed. And I, I think that kind of conveys that sense too. It notice how it says in the Lord and that phrase in the Lord of the Lord as to Christ. I mean, all of this is going to be done when you submit or when you obey to those who have been placed over you in authority that you're doing so to the Lord himself. You know, Luther uses that larvae dei, you know, the mask of God mm. that we, we mm. um, will talk about rightfully so. So to, for children to listen to their parents is to listen to God. So does that mean your dad or your mom is God? No, it's not saying that. However, they speak for him, mm. they serve him. And this doesn't downplay the fact that are there terrible parents? Yes, there are. But here in this specific instance, it's terrible when children do not obey and heed their parents because they are actually sinning against God by doing so. 
I mean, and of course we have, and he'll bring that up, the fourth commandment, you know, honor your father and your mother, that this is a godly thing or it's a righteous thing. You know, to be to be a Christian child, that's what he's, it's, he's not talking even to unbelievers, he's talking to believers. To be a Christian child baptized into Christ, which I think there's connections to infant baptism here too, mm-hmm. um, obey your parents. This is a godly thing for you as a Christian child to do, listen to them. Um, and uh, I mean, even too, as we we think about, uh, you know, growing up, you know, uh, we, we still, um, our parents have that uh, honor and obedience due to them, even as grown children, we're still children. You know, we don't cease to be children um, when our parents are still living. They're, they are our parents and they, now it, it maybe is, is a, a little bit different how that looks, right? But we still, we still have that that command to obey our parents. That is a in the Lord. That, that, that this is a good and godly thing for us as Christian children to do. Yeah, and, and to go like with the thought of vocation here, and the, again the masks of God, and what a what a, even what's a good work? You think about what the world values as good, and even what we as Christians might value as good. We tend to look at the the things that are, are very showy. They appear very pious, and this isn't to say that those you know pious looking good works are, are somehow less, but rather to elevate those works that don't look so pious. So the you know the the child who at home is told, "Please clean up your room," and the child does so obediently. That is a holy good work because God has given it, and, and that is being done in the Lord. And that, that elevation of, the, of what seems to, to us just a, a, you know, a normal thing, or maybe not anything at all, I think is something that really you know, transforms our daily lives. We talked a little bit about this at the end of Ephesians 4, when it talked to the, the thief about not stealing, but rather working honestly, and how that can really transform you know, our lives of labor, the same can be done here with, with our lives as even little children. You know, the, the three-year-old at home who obeys his mother does a godly good work as much as you and I do when we preach a faithful sermon, because both are given by God. And I think that's, again, something that really is important for us in our lives as Christians. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that goes back to that, that whole, you know, wonderful thing about what, what makes the table of duties then so important, too. Is it? It really orders our life. You know, bat, baptism is foundational for who we are. I mean, it's great equalizer in terms of, you know, how we stand before God, and you know, to to make it a godly thing for uh, a three year old, you know, sitting in the pew, and hit, who's getting fidgety, and the mom looks over. And the dad, I just, mom, because my, I, I'm up at that's the front. Right. <laughs> We're not in the pew with our, I know. With our yeah, that's right. <laughs> Which I miss that, you know, but I know it's nice when we go on vacation, you actually get to sit with your kids and then you that's right. have more, you know, compassion for your wife. But, uh, but you know, the, the mom who looks over or the dad who looks over at his kid fidgeting and says, be quiet and listen. And the kid who actually listens to that, it, it, that's, that's a godly thing you're seeing before you. Yeah. And. And so, I mean, Article 6 of the Formula of Concord, you know, talks about this, that, you know, I mean, this is why we we understand passages like this, that God shows us, you want to know what a good work is for you as a ch- child of God? Listen to your parents. That's what is good work. Yeah. And that's where that, there's that substance to it, of that vocation has substance to it. And, and it's, and it's something we should say, okay, well, then I should listen to my parents. And in us as fathers, this is how we teach our children, children too. Part of this li- later of raising them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, um, I, I'll talk with parents about doing family devotions at home. And I said, sometimes family devotions at home look like you holding your leg over one kid to keep him from hitting his sister, you know, and, and all, trying to hold his hands together so he doesn't smack him and teaching them how to pray, right? But you're raising them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And they and you tell them, listen and follow w- what we are saying and 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 uh, reading. Sometimes this obedience looks like stop talking (laughs) and listen and pay attention, right? But that is a godly thing. And uh, they learn from that. And you teach them too, you know, you know, what, what this means too. And I I think as, as Christian parents too, to take it to, to what, what St. Paul does too. You listening to me as your father is you being obedient to God. Are you listening to God? That's what God commands you, you know? Um, But uh, you know, it, yeah, it's just great stuff. 
with that. Yeah, yeah, and and too as well. Then you think about uh, maybe on the other end of the spectrum as we get older and our parents get older, that the honor and obedience is still there, even if it looks different. Again, think about how this elevates the what the world might despise the the child who cares for the aging parents and and sacrifices for them to care for them in a variety of ways. And again, that may look different depending on on you know situations and and abilities and things like that. But just that that simple act that the world says, you know what, don't don't worry about that. Again, that that is a godly thing that otherwise would seem despised that the Lord elevates here in his word as a, a holy task. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, oh, the, the passage is escaping me now, but, but basically those who, you know, who won't care for, you know, their family are worse than unbelievers. That's uh, in First Timothy, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, so as we get older, we, we want to kind of pivot and think, though, the way that I'm obeying my parents is I just can push them off into a nursing home and never talk to them. I mean, we see that, sadly, as pastors, you know, like you, you talk to people who disparage. Now, it's not to say those things don't have a place, you know, of, I'm not, don't take me wrong, I'm not disparaging nursing homes, right? right? But this idea of, I don't need to listen and talk to my parents because I'm an adult now. No, they're still your parent. Talk to your parents, listen to them. Maybe even, it, it just, even that obedience comes from, I'm listening to you because you are my parent, yeah. you know? I mean, some of that, that just even goes, even listening to the stories of when your parents get older and if they suffer from dementia or something like that, that is a good and godly thing for a child to, to listen and, uh, and find honor and, and uh, being quiet and listening to their mom or dad talk to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, yeah. Paul, Paul grounds this in the Old Testament, in the, in the Ten Commandments. He quotes what we often label, what we label as the Fourth Commandment, but then he, he adds to it, at least from what we often memorize in the Catechism. So you get honor your father and mother, but then he reminds you that when the Lord gives that in the Old Testament, there's a promise attached to it, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Talk of, talk about the fact that there's a promise attached to this commandment. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think sometimes we don't... Uh, I mean, CFW Walter talks about the law also have promises to them, attached to them. Hmm. Um you know, sometimes those promises are, you know, uh, do this and you will die, you know, or, you know, <laughs> those true. things like that, you know, that's like, I mean, it's kind of like in, you know, in elementary school, is that a threat? No, that's a promise, right? <laughs> uh, we, we get that. But the, the, the law has promises attached to them, but there are good promises attached to them too at times. Do this and you will live, right? But then you soon realize, well, I can't do that. So then where am I, how am I going to live? Well, you need somebody then to be your mediator or forgiveness, right? I mean, that's where the primary use of the law is the second use of the law. We should never forget that. Right. Now, the but the the promise that goes along with, uh, you, you know, he, he connects it with the first, too, first of all, you know, in terms of, you know, to God, you know, I mean, all the commands come back to the first commandment, no matter what. To violate any commandment is really to, to not fear, love, and trust in God. So when he, t though, ties this promise, then, that it may go well with you, um, He's kind of drawing off of some of the Septuagint language first off here, too. But there are even temporal promises with it, too. We always want to take things into the eternal. But if we understand that God's law is applicable here and now, that you are, it's not that the, the being a children and obeying your parents is in the here and now. It's not a now and not yet thing. That there are going to be temporal promises with that, too. And I think just even a practical thing um, that just kind of at the surface level of this, homes and lands are much better and peaceful when children obey their parents. Yep. I mean, I, I think that's kind of an obvious, well, it yeah, is. it is, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like you obey your parents, things will be a lot more pleasant for you and everybody around you. That's right. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's like, yeah, that actually makes sense. Well, of course, because God actually, his commandments are good and he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. But um, we see, though, then, too, this, um, you know, I mean, kind of other other things, even in, in ramifications in, in the, the scriptures as well. But, uh, but I, I think even just at that base level, you know, that this, things go well for you, things go well for your parents, things go well for your neighbor um, when you honor your father and your mother. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this is, this is uh, on the one hand, well, yeah, of, of course it's going to go better for you. And that, that makes, makes good sense. I, I think the the fact that there is this promise attached to the law is something that we do well to, to keep in mind that it does have benefits to us here and now. Now, the reality that we live in a sinful world and we are sinners does mean that it's not always perfect in the sense that every act of obedience toward parents doesn't always yield the same temporal blessing. I mean, that's just the—you look at the wisdom literature, the Old Testament, a book like Proverbs highlights especially what Paul says here. A book like Ecclesiastes or Job comes along and says, well, not always. You know, these things are not always always perfectly one for one. But yeah, like obedience to parents— makes a huge difference in our in our homes. And and sim- similarly, the the way that parents raise their children makes a huge difference and and we should expect to receive good things when we listen to God's word. That's not to fall into any kind of a prosperity preaching. It's simply to acknowledge the reality that God knew what he was doing when he designed this world and when he told us how it works in his law, and the closer we align ourselves to that, the better that is for us. God really does mean well for us in these things, and so we do well to listen to him and to receive his law as a gift, as his people. We'll keep talking about these things more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Andy Wright this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, August 21st. We're studying Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 9 with Pastor Andy Wright. He serves at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Topeka, Kansas. Pastor Wright, prior to the break, we were talking about the command given to children that their role within the church is to obey their parents in the Lord. God promises great blessing to that when that happens, and we experience that in our temporal lives. This section also speaks to fathers. They are spoken to. So again, as you think about this almost like a sermon, the children's ears have perked up, now their parents' ears perk up next to them. The command given there in verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We have a positive, or a negative and a positive there, as is, we often see. Take us into verse 4. Absolutely. So this this gets to you know kind of the next step of okay we've addressed the the children but what necessitates uh, or what not necessitates what what is implied by children parents you know to to be a child is to have parents and so here then Paul is addressing the parents and and kind of you can almost think about I said you know a few minutes ago that the children's ears perk up and and in my mind and this obviously goes way beyond what the text, but just how you hear things, you know, so you see the parents stick up and the dad sitting next to him, like, listen to what he's saying. Right. right. And now then it's like father. So it's like, Oh, now I got to listen. You know, right. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's not just that. Oh, you really gave it to him pastor. Right. Oh no, I was talking to you too, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but there's a, a negative and a positive and, and that's indicative too, of the whole kind of, I mean, Ephesians does this, uh, you know, um, you mentioned Ephesians four earlier, um, there, Luther has a sermon on Trinity 19 for the epistle that's referenced in Article 6 of the Form of Concord, but they, they lay this out before this understanding of um, kind of what it means to to admonish, uh, you know, to accuse, but also to instruct. Think about the the commandments to we should fear and love God so that, da, da, da. But 
then it has the positive of it too. So, you know, that we don't do this, but so that we do this. So what Paul then is telling now the fathers, so it's not just, okay, dads, you know, just sit back and bask in the honor that is due you, right? Put your, uh, you know, Puff out your chest and say, I'm a father and I deserve this honor and respect. Well, you do because you're a father, but what does that mean? Don't exasperate your children. Don't, you know, don't uh, be, lend them to anger. Don't just, uh, don't be the dad that keeps poking at your kids. Um, that's not godly, right? Don't, um, don't provoke your children to anger. Now, that, that doesn't mean, on the flip side of that, that doesn't mean don't say things if your kids will get angry at it. Sometimes you have to say things and they get angry at it. But that's not on you, that's on them. You know, sometimes when you teach your children, they don't like to be taught, you know, and your kids call you mean or whatever. Well, you're just being a good father then. But don't purposely provoke your children to anger. But do what? What should you do? This is that substance again. What what does it look like? Raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So, um, and and... And I think this really gets to kind of, this is where we see the, our, our sinful nature want to, to really um, kind of uh, attack this. Mm. You know, um, fathers teach their kids so many things by example, or even sometimes, you know, unwillingly teach kids, you know, and uh, fathers are always really excited to have a son that they can teach how to play baseball or are these kind of things and those are good you know or or to have kids and teach them things and but we always are quick to forget what is the primary thing the discipline and instruction of the lord and is it any coincidence then why um fathers are the ones that you have sometimes a hard time getting in the church or why studies show you know just worldly studies that I mean, just reflect the truth that is God's word and creation, that when fathers take their kids to church, they're way more likely to stay in the church as adults. It's because the head of the home, as we heard prior, is the father. He's the head of his wife, and as the head, he has duties that go along with that, raising them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He is, as the, small catech as the head of the house, should teach his family in a simple way. So the duty of a, of a father is to, to raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And what does that look like? Well, to be a disciple, to be a st student yeah. of God's word, to fear and love the Lord. It doesn't mean that the father, the father's not called, be a theologian and then you can teach. No, by being a father, raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Sometimes that even just at brass tacks at, you know, at base level, take your kids to the church and sit with them. That teaches them the discipline and instruction of the Lord, that you're taking time out of your Sunday to actually sit and listen to God's word and listen to it. And then on the car ride home or at the dinner table later, talk about, hey, what did we hear in the sermon today? What did we learn about in Sunday school? You know, what? how about that last hymn we sang? What did that teach us? I mean, just things like that go a long ways, and then you can build off of that. Um, talk to your pastor too. How can I help raise my children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? But that's that substantial content. And, and, um, you know, to, and he's to be a Christian father is, is to actually want to do this to love because we love God. And then we, we want to convey this thing, love to, to Jesus, uh, love of Jesus to our kids. You know, I, I love the space program. I love everything that deals with space exploration. And my oldest daughter has like, she has a few like NASA and space program shirts, you know, and when she wears those, she knows it makes me happy because I like the space program, you know, and, and, and she asked me, she knows that if she asked me a question about like, what was the first moon landing? And then, I, you know, there, the, uh, 45 minutes will go by, you know, and, and <laughs> whatever. But I mean, the zeal that we have for the things of this world can be good and godly, but, but convey that, that same zeal and love to our, our children. And this is where a parallel with pastors too, you can't be teaching your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord if you aren't first, you know, hearing the instruction of the Lord and being in that 
discipline and instruction of the Lord as well. But I mean, it's just, I mean, that's what, what he's giving parents, fathers especially to do. I mean, of course, mothers would be included in this, you know, but fathers especially because as he showed before us, there is an order to creation and there is an orderness to it. And the, the buck stops with the father. You're the one that is called to see that this happens and does it, you know, in your home. Yeah. Well, and, and when it comes to the fear and, or the, the discipline and instruction of the Lord, it certainly starts and ends with the teaching of God's Word, going to church, taking your kids to church, but it's not limited to that either. This, this, this instruction and discipline of the Lord flows into to daily life. Maybe the, the way to think about it from the Catechism would be the way that we, we learn the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. What does it mean that God's name is holy? It means that we learn the Word of God in its truth and purity, and that we live according to that Word of God. And so in, in that sense, this is a very holistic task given to the fathers. Teach your children the Word of God, and then help them live according to the Word of God. And so there, there is a place for teaching your kids baseball, and to do so, you know, in the Lord. That's yeah, just, absolutely. don't let baseball take over, right? I mean... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and, and I, that's a great point you bring up, too. Like, and, uh, or even, like, let use the example of what was just talked about in Ephesians 5. Raising your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord is to actually love your wife, their mother. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's raising them up too to, to, to show, to show them what it looks like to be a godly husband. That's raising them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord or what it means to then to how you, tr you know, um, how, how you, what, whatever your employment is, you know, uh, banker or whatever any number of things like yeah of how do you live in this life as a christian you know and then even to like how do you conduct yourself you know as a you know a christian based baseball player in terms of like you know hey this is we love this and we put and practice it but we're not the ones you know we, but we understand where its place is and and any number of stuff yeah oh it, it's holistic I, I i think that's an excellent point you bring up that and, and it's implicit and it's explicit too. So it's, it's not just sitting down and, and reading, this is, you know, from Genesis chapter three, and this right. is da, da, da. Yeah, there, that, I mean, that ultimately that is, but it is even seen. And that's where as parents that, that call to, to raise and cultivate, you know, the Christian life in your home, you know, is, is even by example, you know, I mean, really, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it goes, that goes hand in hand with a passage like Deuteronomy 6, where, where families are given to, to have the word of the Lord on their lips and in their hearts, wherever they are, lying down, sitting, walking on the way, in their houses. That same, that same way of life is, is prevalent here in Ephesians chapter 6, and, and is so important. The connection that you made about, you know, parents go to church with your children so that then you can talk to them about it, or go to... Youth confirmation classes will be starting here at Faith, and that's one of the things that we ask our parents to do is come to class with your children so that you can talk about these things. A, a recent, just a, one recent example, uh, in the, the three-year lectionary, we recently heard an Old Testament reading from Genesis 9, which speaks about the rainbow that God places in the clouds, and it was that very Sunday, actually, when I was uh, waiting out a rain delay at a baseball game with some of my kids, and we saw a rainbow, and so we got to talk about that. I mean, that's yeah. just the the yeah. simple thing that God gives to us in this life of, of Christian families. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, our whole lives are, uh, you know, we've been crucified with Christ and, and in, in baptism, we've been clothed with him, we've been hidden with him. And so we see that we're not just a baptized child of God on Sunday morning, and we're not just a baptized child of God when we are, you know, sitting around praying and reading the scriptures. You, it covers your very, you know, identity of who you are and that's right and you're teaching your kids to to grow into that that's right so part of that teaching then goes beyond the home that's where paul goes next to maybe our economic life our life in the in the workplace it uses the language and this is we probably need to spend at least a couple minutes just addressing this in the esv i'm reading from the lutheran study bible the the version of the esv that you have there says slaves Obey your earthly masters. The the newer updates to the ESV may use a word like bond servants, or you'll see that in other English translations. Uh, slaves and masters for Americans especially can be a, a triggering kind of thing. Uh, how how should we understand this conversation about slaves and masters or servants and masters? Yeah, that's a that's a big discussion, and, <laughs> and we yeah. got like fifteen minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I think first and foremost, and, and I mean, it's a principle that doesn't just apply to slavery, 
that we should ask ourselves, what is being meant by slave here in the scriptures? It's kind of like, I use the example oftentimes, like we use the word hope differently than the scriptures talk about it. Hope is connected with certainty in the scriptures. The hope of the resurrection is not, boy, that would be nice if that would happen. No, to have hope in the resurrection is to know that it will happen and look forward to it. Um, so a slave in, in the, the New Testament, they we, we shouldn't try to nuance it in a way that kind of lessens the blow. They're, they're property. They are slaves, right? However, when we think of slaves as Americans, we think of civil war. Mm. Is that the case? And here, you know, with when, when St. Paul is talking about slaves here or like in Philemon or, you know, different places like that, it's not always the case. It, it was such a such a broad understanding of slaves. Some slaves were teachers. Some slaves had very high, well-paying things. Some slaves had their own slaves. Now, they were still slaves and not freemen. You know, they were, uh, there was a contrast in the Greek mind, especially between a, a, a slave, a doulos is the Greek word for that, or a, a, a Lutheran, a, a free man, you know, a, a Lutheran, right? That's what I would say. Um, but uh, one who has been set free or loosened. And so there is that distinction that we have to make, that it's not just um, necessarily like an employer-employee type of thing. You know, when you go to, when you go to your job at, during the day, your boss does not own you. It may feel like it at times, but you are not his property. You are a free person. You are not a slave to him. Now, um, there are employer employee employee like relationships that are in in the slavery world of the New Testament, but they're still slaves. So I, we have to kind of just understand like all of that stuff is coming at. Don't just automatically think slave like civil war when you come to the New Testament word for slave. Were there terrible issues of slaves? Yeah, I mean, you can read classic li literature and hear just all kinds of accounts or see some images of slaves being painted as like small people that you're like, oh, those must be children. No, those are actually slaves because some of them thought them as less than human. You know, I mean, so there, there's that whole gambit. So um, I think that's the first and foremost. Okay, so he's talking about slave. What does that mean? That's a good question. You know, how does that imply? But it's a slave. That's what he's using. Sure. Um, so, um, which may seem odd to us, but we have to let the biblical text say what it says. We can't try to make it what we would want it to say because it's easy then well then he should say well then slaves should then be freed by their masters and those things well yeah that would be nice wouldn't it but but he's addressing the, some of these christians are slaves and so he's saying okay you're a christian slave what does that mean and well he tells them he tells them that they are to um you know what what their station in life is to, is to be that uh with to heed or obey your masters with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. And notice what he does then here too, is he doesn't just say, you know, uh, he adds to this, not just with eye service as if pleasing men, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the soul, serving with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that if any one should do anything good, he will receive it back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. So don't just uh, kind of put on a show of obeying your master, but actually, you know, um, the heart is is not just an emotive thing. I mean, we, that's kind of more of an American thing, but, but like for willingly, you know, uh, deliberately, kind of more of that sense to it, obey them. Don't just pay lip, we would say maybe don't just pay lip service to your master. That's, I think, how we would nuance it and say it in our modern parlance. But you know, actually obey your master from your heart. And why is that? Because you're doing it to God. Hmm. You know, that's why you're doing it. The Christian slave understands who it's been who is over him to obey him is to obey God ultimately. And two, that it is pleasing in God's sight and it and it, it doesn't go unnoticed, not to one's salvation, but that God actually does, you know, commend you for that. Hmm.
Yeah, I think, I mean, when you look at the language Paul uses, uh, you know, he talks about, as it's translated in the ESV, obeying your earthly masters, mm-hmm. or you could say your masters according to the flesh. I think there is meant to be a bit of contrast then with who who really is your master, who is, and it is the Lord. You are actually a slave of Christ. He uses that language in, in verse 6, and that reality uh, governs this station in life. And and to your to your point about, you know, we, we need to understand slavery in that biblical context to realize, even when it makes us uncomfortable, some of the reasons why slavery existed, what it was, what it wasn't, why sometimes slaves might have chosen to actually remain in that position, even when offered freedom. We, we need to be willing to, to look at those nuances. It's In our world today, we don't often look at nuance. We just hear a word and, and get blown up by it without thinking. We need to recognize those things, all the while, as you said, realizing it still is slavery. There still is this ownership that isn't a good thing that Christians have have in fact recognized for a while. Uh, Doctor Doctor Winger in his commentary has a nice quote from uh, the Church Father Chrysostom that acknowledges where slavery comes from, and and Chrysostom is living you know a couple centuries after Saint Paul writes. He too recognizes the the problem and where this comes from out of our sinful nature, and I, I think when we hold those things in tension, we can read this in a helpful way. And maybe just just one more point before I throw it back to you is that you think about how Paul spoke to the children and their ears perked up that the children are the church. These slaves are the church, and and in this baptized church they are one with the masters sitting right next to them, and that's that's not nothing. I, I mean, even as Paul you know deals with the reality of his time, that reality says something about where slavery, this relationship falls. Yeah, the, a, the, absolutely. That's, um, there's such a glimpse into not just the picture of the church that Paul gives us here in this, these nine verses, but even just a, a, a reality maybe is the best word. I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure how to, this image that we get, you know, but the reality of what it means to have unity in Christ. You know, um, back in Ephesians 4, he talked about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, you know. Um, and it really is. I mean, that's a true statement. So, uh, or Paul will talk about, you know, in order of salvation, there's neither slave nor free or Greek, you know, or you know, even male nor female. I mean, that's that he's talking about an order of salvation. Now, creation, order of creation is a different issue. And right, I mean, those are different discussions. But, um, but that that idea that here are children with their parents, here are slaves with their master. And what has brought them all together is God. And who are and it's the same Lord that they're all listening to. And it's the same Lord who knows what their station is in life, too. It's not just like, oh, yeah, there are slaves there, aren't there? No, God knows that, and he's speaking to them because he's died for all of them. He's died for the children. He's died for the, the parents. He's died for the slave owners. He's died for the slaves. You know, it's the one Lord and that one baptism that they share. And so when you look around then, too, so who are all of those people? They're the church. That's what they are. Yeah. When, when he speaks to the to the slaves in verse 8, where he says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free, it, although he doesn't use the exact same language as in the previous section, that, that idea of the promise attached to this seems to be prevalent there, which again might be a little surprising. Like there's a, a promise attached to the one who lives as a Christian slave. I think that's the way Paul's saying it there. Yeah, I think so too. And I mean, you know, this... You know, hold, hold on to your Lutheran hat, you know, that God actually commends us for our good works. And, and we, <laughs> we, we, we can talk about that. God, God says, well done to you. I mean, think about the sheep and the goats. The point in that is that he doesn't look at their sin, but he commends them, right? I was hungry. You gave me food, you know, that the slave who was faithful to his earthly master, God will say, good job being faithful to your earthly master. That God will say that to him. Oh, so I mean, good works are actually good. Yeah, they are. They're good. And God delights in them. You know, um, now, yes, they're not saving them. Nobody is saying that. But it's just that we, 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 the scriptures teach us this, you know, that, or, you know, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord for their works do follow them. 
you know, that God will actually commend you for your good works and say, these were good things that you did, and I am pleased with them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, what does he say then to the masters on in verse 9? Yeah, so to the masters then, um, he he also gives them some some st- substance and, and doesn't just say then, kind of like with the fathers, okay, you are masters of slaves, so then now then, you know, you are free to you know have at it. No, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that both their Lord and yours is in heaven. There's no partiality with him. So as as you're a master then and you look at your slave, you don't you there's no partiality with God, I think is the key part of that. And to say so so how what does that mean? How do you view your slave? Well, they're a Christian. Right? They're one that you don't threaten them but you treat them well, just as, you know, fathers are not to provoke their children to anger. You are not to threaten your slaves. You're to do, you're to treat them well, do good to them as well, to be, um, you know, do the same things to them. (laughs) Um, You know, because who's their Lord? God. Who's your Lord? God. Gee, you have the same God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean, again, Paul doesn't, you know, and this is where the, the modern reader might become upset that Paul doesn't say, set them free. Mm-hmm. The reality, the way he speaks, though, it I would say it it undercuts the idea of, of owning another person. Who's your master? God. Who's the slave's master? He doesn't say you sitting in the pew there. He says God is. And so live in that reality, even if the economic relationship at this point doesn't change, live in that reality as a Christian master, I, I think undercuts what, what the typical thought of slavery would have been at the time. Sure, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Because, yeah, he undercuts this idea that, um, and, and, and it wasn't necessarily every person thought this, but right. th- this idea that like they're less than human, for instance, or um, slaves have worth that is beyond their economic value. And that's what, what is their worth? Well, they belong to God and, been, and have been redeemed by God. Is, and that, that means something. So if you're a master looking at your slave, he's not just some, he's not some tree you can cut down. He's not some just, you know, um, even some livestock that, you know, is raised for food and slaughtered. He's, he's a ch- baptized child of God who's here also in this same church listening to this with you. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's where then too, like when we talk about the table of duties, when we talk about the church, when we talk about these things, it, it, it's for the, the, they complement each other, but it goes both ways then too of, so the slaves are hearing what is said to their masters and the masters are hearing what's said to their s- slaves. It's that same word of God for them, just as the children know then too, to obey their parents, but they also know what is called of their parents too. So this instruction, there's accountability maybe you could we could say however there is even this understanding of where you fit in all of this as well yeah. so you know for the slave then to hear this about his master he knows that the trust for him is that my master is a christian earthly master mm. and that means something too that yes. he's not just joe schmo you know offering you know sacrifices to you know, Dionysius or something like that. You know, he actually is a Christian who believes in the same God that I do. And that's going to mean something even in my earthly life as a slave. Yeah. Now, you, I know we said we don't want to just gloss over this as employee, employer, mm-hmm. but there is probably something to that for us as we think about these words in, in our life. And we are kind of running short on time here, but I, I think that's an important thing to, to we don't want to gloss over it. But right. as we think about these words today, that is a way that we can apply them. Yeah, I think we can. It's a, It's yeah, we definitely can apply these to those situations. We just have to, not to the to the fact that we think that that's exactly what he's talking about, or or, or we want to, to uh, rationalize a way that he's really talking to slaves. Sure. So if we understand that he's talking to slaves, but we can see some parallels to what that means between being an employer and employee. So you know, a, a Christian employer has certain responsibilities to employees that he has compassion towards them and understands that you know there are certain duties and requirements and he's running a business but these are people they're not just numbers you know they're not just you know not just uh, indispensable in terms of like well whatever you I, I don't care about you know you know you you need to go and 
uh, your your grandma died. Well, why do you need to go to the funeral? Or you know, any number. Right. I mean, these are real people, and and uh, you treat them as such. And um, so I. And two, then it's not just because somebody's like, oh, well, he's my boss. What does he know? Well, he's your boss, so you owe him respect. You know, you owe him, you know, obedience. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think that's where we really see that kind of stem into certain things that we have that can be applicable, you know, but not at the expense of understanding these were actual slaves that, yep. you know, we, Lord willing, are not in that position. Sure, sure. And, and all of this, again, just to, to wrap things up, all of this is done in the Lord. This is the reality for the people of God, because they, He has made them His people. He has called them into Christ as His one church, and He gives them this way in which they live according to His Word as His people, baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Pastor Andy Wright serves at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Topeka, Kansas. He's been helping us today to study Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. Pastor Wright, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you very much. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Ephesians 6, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us tomorrow as we keep reading in Ephesians 6 to hear about Paul teaching us to put on the armor of God. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk with you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.